Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and on today's episode, I'm joined by Kenny Herrera. We're going to get talking in just a moment. I'm so glad you're here. This is going to be a fun one, I can tell. But for those of you out there, if you're new, go to whistlekick.com. See all the things that we're doing to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. And then when you're done over there, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out all the episodes we've done. They're all there, so many. In fact, we get people on the show and they say, you should have so-and-so on. Well, we, we had them on four years ago. We're in year nine as we're doing this. So don't hesitate to, to poke and look around over there at who's been on the show. Quite a few people that, that you know Kenny, have been on the show. I mean, That's if we awesome. were to, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, now I know who you are because of the circles that you roll in, the ones that I, I get to kind of hang out on the outskirts of. How, how did you get wrapped in with so many amazing martial artists? Well, wow, it's ironic you're in year nine because nine is the magic number in martial arts. So I feel, is it? Okay. I feel really special. I was born in the ninth month, the third day, the root. In 1954, and five and four is nine, so sure. I was built for the martial arts. Uh, <clears throat> you know, my career, I got started. I grew up here in the Antelope Valley in California and playing music. My dad uh, was involved politically, he had parties, and he had a Dixieland band. Mm. One of his partners was a drummer. I was fascinated, threw me some drumsticks. I started playing drums, and then I started playing in a band, and the girls would wink at me and their boyfriends would want to beat me up. So I thought I'd to protect myself. So uh, I started off like a little Daniel and Karate Kid getting all these magazines and in my room doing this stuff. And met a guy, wound up going to a YMCA and met his brother who had just signed up at Sherman Oaks Karate and uh, at a Chuck Norris school. So I yeah. went with him down there and fell in love with the art, started training and Chuck encouraged me to compete and started traveling around competing and met my wife in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the Western National Karate Championships. And um, man, just because of the association with Chuck Norris, he introduced to some of the top martial artists in the world. You know, he brought yeah. Bill Wallace in in 1979 at our first black belt conference to uh, teach his style of kicking. And I loved it and, you know, been doing it ever since and brought in Benny the Jet, teach kickboxing, Gene LaBelle, judo Gene LaBelle with, you know, locks mm. and levers and brought in Joe Lewis. And, you know, Joe had the school before Chuck there in Sherman Oaks mm -hmm. and then brought in the Machados and Gracie's to teach the grappling piece and then the, the Krav. So it's a full, uh, full service martial arts. And uh, it's been real exciting and just so fun, uh, you know, and then being with Bill and traveling to the UK with him for the past 10 years, it's been very exciting. And, you know, he's, he's the best all time kickboxer hands down. So. And, and, and such an amazing man. I mean, oh, just, I, I think that's the part that, um, mm. you know, you might not know that until you get to know him. You certainly, you know him better than I do, but it, that's the part that I'm always struck with when I get to spend time with Bill is how kind he is. And that if, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't talk poorly about some people. You know, I've heard people ask him questions and he's just like, eh, you know, he, he doesn't want to speak bad of anyone. And in my experience, that's not typical of people who uh, reach reach a, a point of, of uh, you know, an ascension, right? Like he, he's done some big stuff. You know, he he well, can come from a place echelon, in the upper echelon. Yeah, like that. Chuck Norris was the same way. Joe Lewis, you know, they they. Um, they're just gentlemen about it. Mm. That's why they're so special in the art. They really live the values, the core core values of the art. And, uh, you know, Chuck's thing, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, don't say anything. Yeah. So that's, uh, re you really take that to heart. And that spills over into all the martial arts and uh, in groups like that with Joe and, and Bill the same way. They'll mm. tease you, they'll have fun. But yes. they, never, they never speak <laughs> ill about anybody, you know. So yeah. they've been great role models uh, for me in my life in that direction. So now, now I want to go back because you you mentioned a quite a long list of very impressive people, but you kind of worked in there. You met your wife through training. Yeah, my wife was uh, she trained with Alan Malaya de Costcos in uh, Denver, Colorado. She was uh, 
top competitor back then. Oh, wow. Um, one of all the major tournaments in fighting and form and team competition. And we go to these tournaments, we'd come out, I'd be holding all these trophies, and everybody thought, wow, that guy's really good, but they were all hers, you know, and I have a little <laughs> medal or something. You know? But uh, yeah. And uh, she was just incredible. And we traveled around so she could defend her title a lot. Mm -hmm. And she knew Bill and Joe and those guys better than I did back then. And um, yeah, it was really fun. And, um, you know, Chuck had encouraged me to compete, him and Pat Johnson. And um, it was exciting. You learn so much about yourself, mm -hmm. you know, being able to put yourself out there and get on the line and do that. And the kind of preparation and what you go through mentally and uh, emotionally during that stuff. And um, so it, it was really good. And then being a musician, I struggled a lot because I, I wanted to stay and train. And Chuck said, no, go do your career. Wherever you go and travel around the country, go to the local school, introduce yourself, tell them you're my student and see what happens, you know. And most of the time it was really good stuff. People were really nice and, and I got to train and, uh, you know, interact and learn things and teach them things. And then sometimes they, oh, you're from L.A., you think you're a tough guy, you know, we're going to show you. And we'd run out of the place, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was it was a great experience. I got to meet JT Will, who was one of the top referees back in the karate yep. days in yep. uh, Columbus, Ohio, and train with him at his school and become friends. And uh, you know, Chuck Norris influenced my whole life. I mean, mm. just all the people and my wife, my kids, uh, everything. So it's been really good. You know, when, when we when we talk about Chuck Norris, we we can look at his influence on the world in a few, there are a few different angles we can come in on. it, And the one that I think is really interesting, it's actually, it's a kind of a, oh, I'm sorry, what did you just hold up there? No, it's his morning kick, his roundhouse. I mean, he's- Oh, and <laughs> now, yeah. Know. You know, if, if it wasn't for the jokes, the Chuck Norris jokes, which, you know, initially he was not so keen on, there's a whole generation that wouldn't know who he is. And so you've got that as one bookend. And then you've got folks like yourself who, when you start, if I'm doing the math right, when you started training, he was not at his peak. No. So, you know, it, it fascinates me, right? That Because we, we don't get a lot of legends, right? And when we look at the martial arts, we don't have a lot of legends and most of them, you know, rarely is is any of us or any of us you know like myself going to see them before they become legends but you know you're talking about some absolutely remarkable people so let, let's start talking about chuck norris and yeah. what it was like you know before the height chuck has always been chuck he mm -hmm. was a visionary back in the day and it doesn't matter the amount of money or fame it's about being that person who you are and being a visionary and he was able to teach that and um, embody that whole concept. And, it, and it's been exciting. And I've got to watch the career flourish and the ups and downs of it, you know, that, that we go through in, in life. It's not perfect and rosy all the time, you know. So um, I think there's a uniqueness. And I know you're into music. And I correlate this a lot with the top musicians. You know, you can have Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. They're all making music in completely different ways and, and approaches to it, much like Bruce Lee, Joe Lewis, Bill Wallace, and Chuck Norris. You know, but the, the one commonality between them is they're all visionaries. They're all creative. They push the boundaries, which a lot of people don't. They get real comfort, comfortable in their own comfort zone, and mm. they don't like to step out. They don't want to be embarrassed. Um, you know, Chuck's one of the first guys I ever met that'll you know, admit that he's wrong and made a mistake mm -hmm. and change course, change directions. And and we do that as a, as fighters. We go in with a plan and things change and, you know, there, there you go. So it's all part of that. And um, you, it, it comes with being comfortable with who you are and pushing that envelope and being able to be true to yourself. And I think it comes from faith. Um, you know, the Christian background that he had with his with his mother and holding tight to that it gives you that strong base and values and look for the best in people, look for the best in situations, assume best intentions and being able to have, be a fierce competitor, but yet hug it up after you're done. And um, yeah. 
and not carry a grudge and that kinds of stuff. So I, I think that's been a tremendous influence in my life. And, um, you know, the others, I mean, with Bruce Lee, with pushing, uh, again, the envelope of, of with boxing and going outside of classical traditional martial arts. And then, you know, the work he did with Joe Lewis, Joe was just a brilliant savant being able to take that information, mm -hmm. synthesize it, um, write it down and put it in a way to fight different kinds of fighters and different approaches to it. And then Bill Wallace having the attributes to execute all of that and just to naturally be able to execute um, maybe with without doing his own version of that, where Bill is, right. is really pushing right now um, the concept in his teaching and being able to articulate what he does, what yeah. he did in the ring, being able to capture that uh, and build the legacy on that. So it's very mm -hmm. exciting to have been around those folks and, and learn what I can. In my teaching, I teach the concepts that I learned from Chuck Norris and the concept I learned from uh, Joe Lewis and the concepts I learned from Bill Wallace and how they're much different. But when you put them into yourself and you adapt them to your style of fighting, there's a lot of value there. And I know when once I started doing that uh, with the three greatest masters, um, my career took off. I was able to, you know, start really seeing the fruits of my labor and competing and, and winning and, you know, winning some championships and that kind of stuff. So mm. uh, when, when you talk about these guys and, you know, we, we've had other contemporaries of that time on the show. And one of the things that strikes me that we definitely lost for a while, and I feel like it's coming back and I'm curious your thoughts on this was they were all sharing with each other. They were all, you know, they'd get in the ring and the best example of this for the, for the audience, if you've never seen the, what is it? 1980 when Bill and Joe fought that exhibition match, best friends, like yeah. claimed best friend. They loved each other dearly beating the tar out of each other, right? The ability to set that aside and then come back. And it wasn't just in that way. They might compete and then go, okay, let's get better because they recognized on some level whether conscious or not, that if they made their competitors better, they had to get better. And it's something I've heard from so many of the folks who were active in the 60s and the early 70s. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I, th I think there's, a, there's something intrinsic about it that's just like being a parent or a mm. grandparent as I am. Um, Chuck had that he expects you to be better than him. Mm. He will teach you everything that he knows. Because just like a father and your child, you're going to teach that child to fly on its own and do everything that you can and to be better yeah. and exceed. And and that's that quality that those folks have. Mm. They're going to teach you, you know, I don't, we have different bodies, we have different heartbeat, we move at different paces, all that kinds of stuff. So then it's your individual and how you develop it. But they would share information. Some people are so selfish that they'll hold information back so they can always yeah. have a lever over you. And that's not that's not being true. Being true is be able to share all that information and hope that your students and the people that you work with can can use that and become better than you. That's the evolution of, of the martial arts. Look how far we've come. I mean, right. Joe Lewis invented the kickboxing. We didn't have it before then. He'd won every major karate event and tournament around what what's the next level well let's incorporate that let's put gloves on and let's go out mm -hmm. and does this stuff work for real and boy if you've ever squared off with joe lewis it's one of the scariest things ever i mean to see that mountain of a man <laughs> you know and, and that intensity where he lines up and comes at you holy buckets you you feel an adrenaline rush like ever yeah and gulp and hope that you know he's he's not going to kill you so to speak <laughs> I, I've you? talked with a number of folks who yeah. went through black belt testings with Joe yeah. Lewis and, and they just, they talk about, you know, clock time, it being relatively short, yeah, but in terms three, of three, impact, three rounds, yeah. yeah, just unbelievable. And, you know, you, you make it or you don't, you get good faster. You don't, you try hard and get better. Or you don't. Well, you know, 
Bill Wallace is the same. His tests are grueling. Chuck Norris the mm -hmm. same way. They have high expectations and high demands. Um, I remember the old days of black belt testing. Not everybody passed. Mm -hmm. And I I remember a test where everybody got through with their forms and Chuck said, you guys are all going to have to come back another day. You're not driving your knee on your front kick mm -hmm. and you're not driving into your stances on your forward stances. And you, you know, you're not transferring power. You don't get it. You haven't mastered the basic fundamentals. So you need to come back another day. Wow. And 11 disappointed candidates that day, but uh, he kept true to himself, the system, and held that bar of quality up. And that legacy continues where we strive hard to keep and maintain those high standards in those organizations today. Yeah. And that's the Chuck yeah. Norris organization, the Superfoot, the Wallace organization, and the Joe Lewis legacy systems. Mm. So uh, I can't imagine there are very many people that have the ties to all three of these gentlemen. I mean, you, you probably know who they are, if there is anyone else. There's six. You... There's six of us in the six, world. There's right six? Now. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe 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 off air we can, I'm, I'm curious. I There are a few, I could, actually, I think I've met two of them. Well, I'll uh, name them for you. To... John Maynard okay. was number one. Steve Smith, yep. number yep. two. I was three. Um, Tony Gooch was four. Dave yep. Sinopoli, five. And recently, as of last year, Walt Lysak, number six. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I know. It's, it's a it's a really great group of guys. They're all just um, cut from the same cloth. They give you the the shirt off their back. They're brilliant martial artists, brilliant teachers, mm. and willing to share and show you the differences and just how to synthesize that together. So, so actually, let's let's talk about that piece. The idea that these are all good people, right? I don't know any of any of the six of you well i'm not going to claim that i know you well but the idea that at these high levels these incredibly capable martial artists are generally at least of, of this generation that we're talking about good people and one of the things i find that we talk about on the show is that sometimes people in, in my mind slip through the cracks and get promoted 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 and they're no longer good people where they aren't good people and they, they achieve rank. What was it about that era or, or that philosophy or whatever that made it different that all of these people are great people in addition to being very skilled? Well, you know, when we were training in the early days, we trained to get black belt technique, not to get a black belt. Mm. So there was a little different concept and the higher ranks, you know, you did, you tested up through third and then there was a lot of honorary ranks beyond that. And people were honored for what, you know, you had, you couldn't just show up three years later and get your rank. You had to be participating, be active in the system. And, you know, Chuck Norris, Pat Johnson, they were pioneers with that because in the, in the Korean system, you only tested up, up through third. But what they started doing is, you know, you're going to test for fourth, fifth, all the way up. And um, because you need to keep continuous improvement, continually learning, you know, learning new katas, learning weapons, um, doing presentations, uh, you know, being able to teach and, and, and different requirements. So they kept evolving like that. And I thought that was really good. And I think from my training partner all these years, I was so blessed to have one of the best guys on the planet, Steve Smith, uh, had that mindset of continuous improvement. And if you look what Chuck Norris taught us, hey, it, what are you going to do next? Now that you've reached one goal, what's your next goal? So, you know, I, I've got black belts in five different systems, 30 ranks, master in three, and and uh, working on achieving a black belt in Filipino stick fighting. And you know, be, having a an accountability partner, a training partner that's going to continue to push you, push the envelope and not sit back and go, oh, look who I am. Look what I've done. It, it doesn't matter, you know, what you did yesterday. What are you doing today? What are you doing? And I think it mm -hmm. comes from those tenants that that Chuck Norris instilled, Bill Wallace instilled, you know, Bill's what, 77? Se and he's, uh, I train every Wednesday with him and he does as many of everything just demonstrating as we do. Yeah. And uh, every time I learn just something new, I've been training this stuff for years, been training with him for years.
but um, you can always learn. You can always get better. And I think that's that concepts that, that they instill in you, that um, continuous improvement, discipline. So you have to take a, a solid inventory of yourself and go, well, what's discipline? What am I really doing? Am I really behaving the way I'm claiming mm -hmm. I am and doing that? And I had to take inventory and, and say, no, I'm, I'm really not. I need to get better. I need to do better. I need to be more disciplined every day. So it starts a lot with physical, um, having that mental attitude. But but you got to do something physical to get those endorphins going. So every morning I've disciplined myself that I get up and do 100 push-ups. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a motivation. So I use my granddaughter's. I do 10 for each one of my granddaughters and 25 for my grandson and 25 for my other three kids. And, re, you know, just religiously every morning when I get up, I do that. And if for some reason I can't the morning, I pick it up later in the day or before I go to bed. But I got to be true to myself and be disciplined to do that. And other folks do other things. I know some of my friends got shoulder injuries and they can't do pushups, so they find something else to do. But if, even if it's just brushing your teeth and making your bed, find some kind of a discipline that you can do every day so you can feel good about yourself and, and move yeah. that on. And, um, you know, not only the discipline, but so many people, we, we live in a culture and we grow up, we're very selfish. It's about me. And um, it's, it's like, how are you using your art to help other people? And, um, you know, are you, are you so, are you open-minded enough to understand that other people need what the values that you're getting in the martial arts and they need them sometimes more than you do. And um, I feel pretty good and fortunate that I'm, I'm healthy. I got all my original parts where a lot of folks my age, you know, <laughs> they got new knees and hips and all those kinds of stuff. And those are challenges in themselves. But I, I look at people that uh, are overcoming real physical obstacles, like maybe only have one arm or they're in a wheelchair mm. or they have a severe disability that limits their their breathing or the way they move. How vulnerable do you think they feel? Um, I know a lot of self defense classes I do. I go into some um, facilities where you know there's military guys that have lost their legs or an arm, and boy, they still they feel vulnerable. And when you can give them some techniques that they can do, it really empowers them and makes them feel good about themselves. And and nothing is better than raising the ability to defend yourself and your family. So. Um, you know, it's 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 about giving back. And you look at those examples, Chuck Norris giving back through UFAF and um, the United Fighting Arts Federation organization and all that he does there and, and just being that inspiration. And Bill Wallace, you know, he travels to, I go to the UK with him and he's a superstar over there. It's like going with Mick Jagger or something, you know. Yeah. Um, they love him because he shares and he, he empowers them and makes them better and willfully gives of his time and, and energy. And uh, I don't know how he does it sometimes, but it's um, it's it's just really cool to see people like that. And Joe Lewis was the same way. And um, it's really neat. And what I'm excited yeah. about is the next generation of superstars that are coming up, like, like Terry Dow and, mm -hmm. you know, um, just different guys in different organizations, you know, the Chip Wright that was there with Chuck Norris, his stunt double, yeah. and just some amazing people out there in different organizations. And um, and guys like Chris Natsky, they got visions that are that are keeping yeah. this stuff going, keeping this stuff alive. Um, and Paul Barnett, the work that he's doing over there in England, bringing these people over and introducing them to the UK martial artists. So there's a lot of great stuff going on. I spoke to Dave Brock this morning. Uh, they got the legacy um, Long Beach International stuff going on where they do a oh, Hall cool. of Fame there. And, you know, it's just exciting to see that there's a lot of people that still care about the martial arts. Cynthia Rothrock, the work that she's doing around the globe and, and yeah. through her film. Um, it's it's just exciting. They're, they're very inspirational to a lot of people that need inspiration today. And, um, you know, the world's a little chaotic and uh, people are struggling economically and uh, and it's um, martial arts is a good opportunity to divorce your mind of any kind of bad stuff and stay focused on in the moment and what you're doing and and feel good about yourself and and be able to tentacle out and, and help other mm. people. So, 
completely agree with, with everything <laughs> that you that you just said that that in the moment piece i think is something that we are so desperately in need of these days you know the world is is clamoring for our attention constantly you know we're, my phone's right there yours is probably not far away you know, a good many of the folks watching or listening to this episode are doing so on a phone this thing that just commands so much of what we're we're doing but yet we don't bring our phones on the training floor no right we well, we're, we we separate that we we recognize the value in stepping away from it for a time well you know you bring up a good point and i i think it's the the exciting piece for me is the community mm. you know the the community that chuck norris had at that the early school in sherman oaks i mean that was a melting pot i met you know movie stars and musicians and car mechanics and hairdresser i mean it's a myriad of all the different people but when you got on the mm. map they all leveled out you know there was no superstar on the mat except chuck norris you know and uh, everybody learned together and it was a real common thread that that uh, everybody could share and, and equal I, I was blessed to be uh when when chuck started sold the school to pat johnson and started acting lessons pat took over chuck's private clientele and used to teach steve mcqueen there and i got to be steve's workout partner oh cool was what was that like it was incredible i mean a little intimidating at first when i first met him and you know he pulled up in the back alley he had just finished towering inferno and had a big beard and his wife Allie mcgraw and she'd be in a black dress doing her nails and he'd come and shake sweat on her you know and she and we'd work out and but once again once you got on the mat he was very respectful called me mr herrera and i mean it was uh it, it was so cool to see that just what martial arts humbles people and and gives them and, and made me feel good about myself that, you know, I, I could help him and share. And uh, it was just really unique situations and getting to meet a lot of musicians and, you know, um, Ralph Johnson from Earth, Wind and Fire. We, we got a chance to work out and it's just really cool stuff. And, and all the way from Earth, Wind and Fire to, you know, Emery Gordy that was playing with, you know, Elvis Presley and um, Neil Diamond and Roseanne Cash back in those days and, and had a country background, wound up going to Nashville. So well, let, um, let's talk about music for a second. You you know, if anybody watching can see their drums in the background and, you know, I've, I've overheard you and Terry kind of compare notes on drumming in the past. And there seems to be a lot of crossover between martial artists and musicians. First, would you agree with that statement? Totally agree. Totally okay. agree. And secondly, why? I'm not a musician. I appreciate music. I love music. I just don't play anything. So why why the crossover? Why that intersection there? Well, I think number one, it's an art form, mm. much like it's freedom of expression, like like the martial arts are. Um, you know, famous drummer Buddy Rich was a black belt. I don't know. If I didn't know that. People knew that. Yeah. yeah. But it's all about rhythm and uh, timing, you know, you, Joe Lewis used to teach about broken rhythm like Bruce Lee and it's timing of when you can go in there to get your technique in and get a punch mm -hmm. and you find the rhythm of the other person and you counter that. And uh, so there's a lot of synergy between drumming and, and martial arts that I see, but the challenge of the art form piece of it and, um, you know, kind of like, kind of like the martial arts, there's, if you look at the yin and yang, you know, part of the yin is the is the art form of it that we practice the art and we learn about the, the history and the breathing and the balance and all the technical pieces. And then we got the sport part of it where we want to go and try and use those techniques and see if we can get in there and, and make them work. And the whole time we're keeping in mind the self-defense aspect of it in the street. How would I use this in a real situation mm -hmm. to protect myself? which we hope we never have to do. And much like music the same way, we can do it just for ourselves where we can play and practice and work those notes, the, the art um, piece of it like that. And then we can go perform with ensembles or groups and get that sport piece of it and um, do that. And then we can go perform, which is mm. a big thing. 
And much like a street situation, that's where the adrenaline rush comes, the nerves come in, all of a sudden everybody's looking at me, where you gotta stay in the moment and, and be on, on task and, and perform. Much like fighting, I find when I'm playing, I gotta concentrate. If I make a mistake and I start thinking, oh, I made that mistake, I make another mistake. Mm. You gotta stay in the moment. Same like with fighting. If you make a mistake, you start thinking about it, you're gonna get hit again. Yeah. You know? So it's it's there's a lot of similarity there. Yet one of the artists I work with is one of the greatest, a guy named Peter White from England. He has a phrase, don't dig on yourself. So if you do something really good, don't be thinking, oh, how cool am I? I just did that because you're gonna get hit again. You know, yeah. you're gonna make a mistake right after that. So it, it really, the arts teach you to stay in the moment and be in the moment and enjoy the moment. Don't be in the past, you know, prepare for the future, but don't be thinking the future, you gotta stay in the moment. If you stay in the moment, it'll all take care of itself. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a lot of times in life, we try and push things, make things happen, do this and that. Whereas sometimes if we just let things organically percolate on God's timing, things work out a lot better for us. Mm, so true. Yeah, that this idea that, you know, when we're when we're fighting, sparring, whatever you choose to call it, you have to remain present, or you're going to get punched in the face, right? That this, you know, whether whether the last exchange went well for you went poorly for you, you have to put it aside, you can unpack that later. And I think there are a few places where you absolutely have to set those things down. You know, when, when you're when you're playing, I would imagine that you you there isn't quite the same uh, physical deterrent to remain present. You know, you can you can miss some notes or, or or fall out of tempo, and yeah, it's not good, but it's probably not going to injure you if if well, you, know, you, if you miss. It's funny you say that because it brings to mind Pat Johnson, who was Chuck Norris's number one black belt, took over mm -hmm. over the organization when Chuck started off doing the film, um, brilliant teacher. And he used to say, you can probably get hit three times in a fight and survive, but beyond that, mm. probably not. And you get to choose where you get hit, mm. okay? So if you don't wanna get hit in the face, you better learn to protect your face and, and that kind of stuff. But um, beyond that, you're, it's going to be trouble. And it's kind of the same thing playing music. You don't want to do, you know, if you make a mistake, that's one thing you're, you're human. You're going to make some mistakes during a performance, but it's how well you recover from that. If you go, ah, oh, shoot it, you know, and you don't, or make a sour face, like everybody's going to know it. But if you make mm -hmm. it like that's part of the show, it's just like much like you do when you're sparring, you, somebody hits you and good shot, you know, you, you keep going. Yeah. You, um, you know, oh, poor me and all this kinds of stuff. So, you know, the good fighters, that's what was so cool about the Chuck Norris organization, guys like um, John Natividad, Bob Burvis, Chip Wright. They were so elite that they could, they would be happy for you if you scored a point on them or did something good. They would acknowledge mm. the good stuff that you did. I don't see a lot of that today. I see, you know, people are like, uh, he didn't really get me or <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, and that's kind of what I was mentioning before. I feel for, like yeah. in pockets, it's coming back. Yeah, yeah. I feel, I feel like it's starting to come back. I, um, you know, in, in the work that I do, I, I do travel a, a decent amount and, you know, I'm sometimes at competitions, whether it's, you know, amateur MMA or maybe it's more of a, a point fighting competition. And I see more of that than I used to say 10 years ago. So I'm hopeful that we're coming back on that because that's how I was raised. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, I'm younger, but I was raised with what I now understand to be that older mindset. And I'm, you know, that's, that's how I think I'm quite appreciative of it. Well, I think, you know, it's the 80-20 rule. I think 80% people are doing the right thing, you know, and tr mm. striving for it. But, you know, we live in an imperfect society and not everybody's perfect all the time. And I think it's incumbent upon instructors to teach those values that we learned and, and carry them on. That's carrying mm. on that legacy. And it's being true to yourself, you know, 
we're not perfect. And if somebody scores a point on me, I need to acknowledge that and go, Hey man, good shot, you know, and, and then go back and how could I have done that differently? Maybe pull my arm down or this and that. Yeah. So, um, you know, and that's being true and that, that helps them that they know that it was valid that what they did and, and it helps both of us. So that's, that's what you want is a win-win in this thing. I, I would imagine being perfect is boring, right? Like one of the things I, I love is, is all these opportunities to get better. You know, I, I was actually taking stock of this earlier this morning, just, and what really gets me fired up is, oh, here's an opportunity to learn and to improve this aspect of my life. Yeah. But the things that I'm, I'm better at, you know, yeah, they're good. And I want to maintain those skills, but just being good to the, Eh, eh, I want to get better. I want to find the things I'm not good at and make those better. Yeah. That's Well, and I think the other thing is, is that, um, you know, as, as we mature in life and mature in the martial arts, we get, we get more knowledge. We get more mm -hmm. things we got to get good at. <laughs> and, uh, it takes, it takes more time and more, um, dedication to be able to to keep those perishable skills up and right. what that requires is a is a solid strategy a, a life strategy you know and um i'm blessed that some of the top martial arts guys are have also expanded into the fitness world uh you know anthony albany is one of my dear friends in mm -hmm. uh, east coast you know he's a fitness nutrition coach he he helped me a lot with um, just ensuring that I get a proper eight hours sleep and get the right water intake and food intake. It's really helped me be uh, a better, higher performer and uh, in what I'm doing. And we need those strategies as we uh, as we mature in life. You know, I was telling you, Chuck Norris yeah. got into everything with the roundhouse. I started doing the supplement. It's just a, a powdered stuff. That um, and this isn't an ad for it, but it worked for me and just getting making sure that I got all the right nutrients and stuff. And I felt I feel great. I felt yeah, great. It, um, it is remarkable to me how much we discount the really fundamental things, you know, sleep and water and yeah. and eating decent food. And 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 it's all, you know, it's led to an observation for me. And in this I, I make this statement and people sometimes get upset at it. You can't out science nature, right? We, we've, our, our body has become, what, however you look at the body, right? Whether it's evolution or design or creation, it is what it is, right? We have this and it is used to certain things. And it wasn't that long ago that those things were plentiful and we don't give it those things now. And people get shocked when it doesn't work well. Yeah. But I think, you know, if you look at, uh, the history of the martial arts and the battles and these guys, a lot of these guys, their training methods, hitting Makawaras to deform their bodies. You know, they, they expected to die in battle. They didn't expect to live to be a hundred. Right. Um, they deform their bodies. They kick tree stumps. They do all they get phlebitis by the time they're 40. Um, yeah. I don't want to be like that. I want to live to be a hundred and be able to see my grandkids and great grandkids. And, yeah. and I want to keep continuing to study and practice martial arts. And in order to do that, you need a healthy body or as healthy as you can be, whatever it is, it is, but, you know, maintain what you have to the best of your ability and, and be able to train and, and adapt your training. Remember Chuck Norris taught me that years back. He said, quit hit, quit kicking a heavy bag. You're going to destroy your hip lining mm. uh, for a time he kicked in water. And we, you know, Bill uses a soft bag to kick and we kick for speed mm -hmm. and uh, not that pounding on the, on the hip lining. So, you know, as, technology improves and the world evolves. We evolve our training methods and, you know, we're not, I want to play drums. I don't want to beat my hands on concrete and stuff. And uh, so we're smarter about what we do and taking care of our health. Health is number one. If you're not healthy, you can't train and do that. And so it's imperative that we, we take care of our health and then it's got to reach out. You got to take care of your, your spouse, your, your mate in that case and your children and your grandchildren. And I know we're on a special Halloween day, so yeah, I'll save my grandkids. I'll eat some of their candy for them. You know? <laughs> it's very kind of you. 
but uh, you, it, it, health, health first, you know, there's you, in addition to coming up at a time when everyone was, was sharing, you know, my understanding it, is there was quite a bit of just banging your head against the wall, really rough, difficult training. And, and I look at it now and you talk about, you know, we improve, we, we start to learn. And if you're always leaving training, limping, and you've always got things that are hurt, you know, to me, that's the opposite of self-defense, right? If your training is constantly damaging you, well, not only does that make you less likely to perform well if you need it, but it seems counterproductive. Totally agree. Um, <clears throat> you know, Bill Wallace has his training methodology that works for him and his teaching and his his weight training, his boxing training and shadow mm -hmm. boxing. I've incorporated a lot of that into, into what I'm doing. But um, you have to, you can't, I mean, Chuck Norris, I had a lot of discussions about it. You can't overtrain. You know, your body needs recovery time. So if you train hard on Monday and you stretch and you fight and you're banged up, bruised up, Tuesday, you got to give yourself a rest. And that might be the time where you work on your artistic piece of it, maybe your forearms mm -hmm. or something else to balance. Remember the yin and yang. You got to find that balance in your life with everything you do and let your body give it time to recover. And everybody recovers differently. It might be one day, two days, whatever that comfort zone is for yourself. But I think the one thing where that discipline comes in is that you can train every day some aspect of your training, whether it's reading a book, watching a video. We're so blessed today. I mean, when I was coming up, Chuck encouraged us to write everything down in a notebook. And there was Black Belt Magazine and some Bruce Tegner books and stuff. But today you can train with any top martial artist almost anywhere in the world, any time of day on your computer or cell phone or YouTube. It's it's amazing. I, I got I train people online, Germany, East Coast, uh, oh, cool. South. It, it's pretty exciting how you can do that and, and get a lot out of it. Um. So to supplement your training like that, it's it's really mm. awesome today. And um, there's no reason why you can't carve out, you know, they say if you take 17 minutes a day working on something that within a year you'll be ahead of 90% of the people on the planet. So that that's pretty amazing statistics. So you can- Yeah, if I'm find doing out my math- You're wasting. Right. Two minutes a day ends up being for most people, an additional, I think it's month of training. And if you go, you know, if you're, if you're going four days a week, maybe it's an extra two weeks, right? Two minutes a day. And you might think, you know, how, what can you do in two minutes? Well, um, you know how long two minutes is if you've do been to a super foot test. I can do my 100 push ups. I know that. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that you're, you've kind of, sh maybe shifting gears isn't, isn't the right word, but that you're training in, in with sticks now you're doing some yeah. Filipino martial arts for the past. What prompted that? Cause that, that feels like quite the departure from the other things you've talked about. <clears throat> well, um, my accountability partner in martial arts, mm. Steve Smith, um, we trained with a gentleman named Anthony Kleeman from Australia. He's from mm -hmm. Australia. Uh, he's got a black belt with Benny, the jet. In addition to that, he used to train out of the jet center and, um, fabulous martial artist and we do key lot which is her hand techniques and mm -hmm. boxing techniques and then it evolved into knife fighting and then uh, into sticks but um we study dose paras filipino martial art of uh mm -hmm. of stick fighting and it's fascinating it's it's um i'm used to having drum drumsticks in my hand a funny story on that um yeah a few years ago Steve and I went with some with a friend of ours, another uh, Joe Lewis, uh, Bill Wallace black belt named John Graham. We went to the Philippines and then to China for some teaching and competitions. And while we were in the Philippines, we were talking. He goes, "Man, um, I'd really love to hear you play drums sometime." I go, "Yeah, there'll be an opportunity." And we we went to this mall and I bought some Kali sticks and. Um, Here they are right here. I'm getting them for you. But they yeah. came in a nice little bag and you know, they're uh they're about 
29 inches long and they're real pretty. Yeah. So I had these with me and we're walking along the boardwalk and he goes, yeah, I'd really love to hear you play sometime. And all of a sudden we look over and there's a band playing a big pavilion and a set of drums there with no drummer. I, he goes, here's your chance. I, I go up there. So did, did you play with the counting sticks? There's no sticks on the set. <laughs> Their drummer hadn't showed up, so I pulled out these collie sticks and I start playing. And the singer turned around. And she's like, "Yeah." So I jammed about three songs with them until their drummer. Oh, I showed love up. it. It was just like a god moment. It was really funny. That's super cool. But had, had you ever had you ever used because those sticks are oh. quite a bit thicker? Have you ever done that before? No, I haven't. But uh, I used to use parade marching sticks. They were big around like that. Okay, it was kind of fun. Oh, what a ride! But yeah. The, the music stuff's fun and the the stick fighting is uh boy it's intense and it's uh there's a lot to it i'm learning a lot you know taxing my brain trying to get all the all the forms and uh all the are, are there things i would imagine the footwork stuff plays fairly well back and forth but are there other things that you have to i mean unlearn might be too too firm of a word but are there are there instincts that you have to temper Yes. You know, that's a great point. Um, I've been, I taught a seminar last, well, this past summer at UFAF conference. I'm teaching it again next month at the Western Tong Sudo. I call it BOCAT, the blending of classical and traditional martial arts into modern day. And, um, you know, like the yin and the yang, there's, there's different attitudes towards fighting. If you look at, um, all the classical forms, they, they step into the attack, you know? Right. So much like Krav Maga is moving forward. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're shielding, moving into the attack. Um, with the evolution of martial arts and the instinctive in today's world, we got video cameras all around and um, people are defensive. They move mm -hmm. away. I don't want to get hit. I don't want to get involved. So like the new Chuck Norris uh, UFAF forms, they're all moving away. The first move is away and rather than the classic way of moving in. Oh, so it's a little different philosophy, different thing. So um, doing the sticks, it's a lot of zoning. They call it zoning. It's, it's indirect fighting that if you compare it to like a Joe Lewis system. And um, it, it's moving all directional. You know, kind of like, kind of like the uh, the clock method, where you're moving in, you're moving out, just direction, and it's based on distance, whether you're at a, at a long range, medium range, or close range. So, um, just a different way of thinking of things, and um, you know, there's a lot of things that I can apply that are universal through the other martial arts I've studied, but a lot of, of things course. that are brand new concepts that I've had to kind of retrain myself to uh, to think at differently. And so as you're doing that, does that create moments with some of your other, let's call it more, uh, the, the, the training that you've done for longer, stuff you're more comfortable with, does that, do you bring that stuff in and go, oh, I, I want to change this, I want to adjust this, does it start to permeate? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, I, again, I'll use it like like playing music. One of the things mm -hmm. you have to do that, like Bruce Lee talked about, when you go to training, you have to empty your cup. You have to empty, okay, all that bias and all that stuff that you have in your brain with that. But at the same time, you have to hold true to who you are and, and what you are and how you move. Um, you, you typically people revert back to their basic style. And fortunately, I got a good base with Chuck Norris and the Tong Sudo. So I revert back to that. And that's my base that I do everything based off of. So I think like with with playing music, I, I'll learn things in playing um, jazz drumming that will spill over when I play country. Mm. The way it's approached, the way it's, it's, it's um, manipulated on top of the beat. And it's the same thing, I think, with martial arts. You can blend certain aspects of it into one another and you can articulate. Um, one of the things that you know, I changed in my program. When you have your own school, I had a school for 23 years. Um, one of the things when you have your own shingle up and your own school, 
you get to do things your own way a little bit. Uh, but staying within the framework and parameters of your association and that kind of stuff. So one of the things I changed was some terminology. Um, when my kids were little and when I was growing up, I learned up, down, forward, backward. Mm -hmm. So when they would say slide up, I'd, I'd always move up because that mm -hmm. was up direction. And no, no, they'd spend all this time saying, that's not what I mean. Well, say what you mean and mean what you say. I want you to move forward. Well, then say slide forward. And then it keeps your head down. I mean, so terminology and linguistics has such an impact and effect on people. So, um, you know, there's there's a book called uh, Verbal Judo that's very... Mm. I've been a lot of people talking about that book yeah, lately. It's, it's written by a police officer that encountered many different types of cultures. And, and the difference in all the in all the cultures um, is so interesting. I'm getting a phone call here. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is because they all interact different. Some cultures mm. have their head down and no, oh, look me in the eye. Others get right up into your face. Uh, some use the hand movements. And mm. so you have to be cognizant of all these cultures. Um, so you're not offended by them and they're not offended by you. So it's it's kind of interesting when you study that and go around, you know, you travel around the world. I don't speak all these different languages, but you can use hand signals and, you know, I'm t I'm tired or I'm, I'm I want to hungry or. So there's all these, you know, physical communications that you can do. So the mm. communication is like the number one thing. Um, and as you become a good in teacher and instructor, the way you communicate is so important with your students and you're communicating visually. So you better make sure that when you demonstrate something that it's accurate and it's the right thing, or they'll, you could look at students and tell who their instructor was because they do it just like them, whether it's flawed or not, you know, and um, right, right. real interesting perspective with that. The other thing is um, being able to, articulate what you want and it's using those language you can get quicker results if you say slide forward rather than slide up and just just things like that and the way you make sense um you know what's interesting you get like with a bill wallace uh, my wife was the same way how do you do a round well they just do it their bodies are just so incredible that they can just do it effortless where me i was like huh i gotta break it all the way down all these little components. Well, you slide up, you inhale as you do that, you coil your leg. And so I could became a good teacher with it because I could break it down to all those mm -hmm. little elements. But um, not everybody needs that or has that. Vice versa, having, you know, come up with Chuck Norris, Pat Johnson, you, you can assess talent. You can see what's going on with somebody and, and fix them. Um, coach them up really quickly by knowing these key factors on, on what leads to body movement and, and all of that, mm. the, the science behind it that you're talking about. And everybody's built different. And so it's the connection of all those different kinds of people that you meet and experiences and being able to communicate with them. Bill's mm. been very effective. Uh, we teach the European teams over there, uh, kickboxing teams in Wales and England, Scotland, and they've done really well in that. European circuit over there and um, a lot of it's using those techniques. So oh, cool. You you mentioned wanting to train for longevity and, and you know, I think I heard you say you wanted to train, you know, when you were a, a hundred. <laughs> does does that mean that there are, are, you know, on the other side of the Filipino martial arts training, is there something you're looking at next or next? Are there other things that you want to experiment with training wise? Yeah, you know, um, that's a great question. Um, I want to continue to explore and perfect the arts that I already know and, and do mm -hmm. um, with the with the Chuck Norris system and, you know, with Superfoot system and, and Joe Lewis system. But like within Chuck system, um, we have a BJJ program. You can black belt in that. We have a Krav program. You can black belt in that. So I've achieved ranks in the Krav. Uh, I'd like to someday maybe get a black belt in that. Pursue that. Cool. 
just to um i you know had some top crowd people i met with earlier in the year and wanted me to get into their program and i just don't have the mental capacity for it right now i, I got too many other things going on because i understand because you know yeah. i would i'd love to do that but i can't commit to it because of just other time constraints and and mind capabilities right now yeah. um very wonderful art you know offers a lot of things i love the jujitsu i early in my career uh with the jujitsu with the chuck norris system in the early 80s uh, we trained with the muchados and and hoist gracie and i mean there's none better i, I loved it um when it became so popular you brought a lot of different folks in that had different agendas and they'll try and tie you up and pull your shoulders out and your knees out. And, you know, so I'm, this is what I got left. I want to really preserve it, make sure I work with good high level people that aren't going to injure me. And uh, I like doing that piece of it, you know? Nice. All right. Um, what, what else, what, what else, what else is coming? What else is next? You know, next, you know, I'll, I'll see you at some point, probably maybe this year, but probably at some point next year. And I say, Hey, Kenny, what's going on? What, what do you want to tell me has happened? Or maybe, maybe we, we look out a few years. Well, first off, it's been a very exciting year. I spent the first part of the year on the East Coast with Bill Wallace and mm -hmm. teaching seminars. And uh, we were in New York and New Jersey and uh, Philadelphia and then Atlantic City for the, the big events there. And then um, we went to England, taught over there for a few weeks and attended the Hall of Fame Awards. That was always great. And then... Uh, came back and was in uh, Las Vegas for the UFAF conference yeah. and competitions. And, you know, um, I'm still blessed that I, I can still move around and compete and do stuff and, you know, did nice. well and, and it was exciting. Um, last year, Chuck honored me with the uh, Waylon Norris award, the highest mm -hmm. award in his system. So it's, it's been continuous. Um, That's great. Promoted me this year in in that to uh, six degree, so that was exciting. And then um, being promoted in the Joe Lewis system to fifth degree, so um, just continuous improvement. I want to mm -hmm. do that. And and next year got plans to uh, head over and back to England with Bill and May and go to Germany, do some teaching over there, and uh, spend time teaching my grandkids. And that's always fun. It's kind of going full circle. I used to teach my kids. Oh, that's uh, that's awesome. Kids are, are doing that. So seeing how I can share the art and, and do other things. We've got some um, conferences to go to next year and some awards shows. So it, it's it's going to be fun. It's going to be filled with stuff, uh, music stuff. I worked the uh, past couple of years with Peter White on a new smooth jazz album that's going to be coming oh, out nice. in release first of the year played percussion on that. Um, so I love doing that. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll be doing some performances for that next year. And we did some performances this year, played up in Yosemite in and the, in the Redwoods mm. up there and uh, Sequoias. So yeah, it's been fun. It's been a great year. And big awesome. year for, for my wife and I next year, we'll be married 50 years. And Congratulations. Yeah, That's amazing. The same one. It's and all because of Karate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, if people want to get a hold of you, how do, how do they do that? Probably the best. Website, my, social media, anything like yeah, that? Yeah, I'm on social media and, and you can post my uh, my email up there, kenneth.nolan.herrera222 at gmail. And uh, mm -hmm. always up for that. Awesome. Well, I'm going to throw it back to you in a moment to close us up, but to the audience, thanks for being here. Thanks for, I mean, you should be thanking me for these amazing stories that, that we brought you. And, and certainly I, I thank you, Kenny. Uh, if you want to support, you know, shoot over guest ideas or topic ideas, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Follow us on social media. We're at whistlekick and you know, you, you know, all the ways that you can help us out. And I really do appreciate those things, but it's, it's time for you to close it up for us, Kenny. So what, you know, how do you want to leave things with the audience, the folks watching, listening today? Well, there's what do you always, want them to think about? There's always that untold story. You know, 
Next time we'll get into talking about some of the experiences with Karate Kid. Got to work on yeah. those films, and that that was a lot of fun. And I got a part in Karate Kid Three and my own trailer. That was pretty exciting. Cool. Coming up during those days, and um, Joe Lewis's movie uh, Force Five got a fight scene with Benny Arquitas in that. That was pretty exciting. Yeah. So there's there's more to me. Wait for next edition. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, it's a lot more to you. That's for sure. Only well, right. just begun. Well, we can do a whole conversation on him sometime. Okay. Uh, Pat was in the early days, you know, when, when he first came out from New York um, at Sherman Oaks. He's the one that, you know, Chuck was Chuck. And then Pat Johnson, yeah. no, he's Mr. Norris. That's when we started calling every black belt Mr. Mm. That's the one that brought all that discipline and influence in, bow before you enter the mat, that kind of stuff, and uh, started really organizing things in the curriculum. Chuck, you'd walk off the mat, you were dead, tired, sweating. Pat, you'd walk off and your head was exploding of mm. information. Just a brilliant instructor. <laughs>